empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Be water, my friend. Welcome on the Flow Great Show. Finally, I can welcome you here. Hey, well, thank you very much for having me. Excited to be here. And, and the last time we saw each other was actually in Finland. And I remember you, uh, well, first of all, we sat in the bus together to the, the dinner before the event. Yeah, the bus and the train and all that. Oh, yeah. The... And the tent. We slept together in a tent in, in wild Finland and had yes. to keep a fire burning. A group of people up and everyone had to do his shift and... I remember you lying next to me and we both were not really excited about the whole thing like everybody else. We couldn't really sleep. We, we were in the lucky tent. The other tent had a, had a problem with the heating and it was, I mean, a night that was well below freezing. I think probably like, you know, negative five, negative six Celsius. And uh, yeah, our, our tent was, was vaguely uncomfortable, but the other people really uh, took it in the shorts. Yes, they really did. And we talked about a lot of stuff and obviously one of uh, your your major topics that you're asked about is smart drugs since you have this, I'd, I'd say it's probably the most well-known supplement podcast out there that I know. Uh, and that, uh, I hear yeah, for, 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 for stuff above the neck. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of great biohacking stuff going on in, in various podcasts. I sort of try to isolate my stuff to just brain related so I can not get too overwhelmed. And maybe to start this podcast off with the sort of an icebreaker that I ask sometimes, but what is something that you've come across recently that you're really excited or passionate about? Hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, I guess I'm going to say that this is sort of a throwback, but it's something that I've started getting into again recently and am excited about going forward, which is uh, flotation tanks, or as I prefer to call them, the old school name, sensory deprivation tanks. Um I, I recently have stopped being one of these people that moves perpetually, and I'm actually now a honest to goodness homeowner, and I've got a basement. <laughs> in fact, in fact, I'm in my basement right now as we speak, and I'm really thinking of uh, you know, maybe as a summer project, either buying or building a um, you know, sensory deprivation tank for down here. Oh, okay, fantastic. And why is that exactly? What does it do for you? Well, you know, it, it's kind of one of these things that you can use it in a bunch of different ways. Um, you know, athletes use it for, you know, physical reconditioning and getting your body in like a, you know, a total, total neutral buoyancy where there's no pressure anywhere on you. And it's supposed to be great for, um, you know, physical therapy and relaxation. Um, I've, I've, I've always been one of these people that kind of appreciates meditation in theory. Like when I read about what the results are that other people have seen from it, the, uh, you know, the increasing growth in, um, you know, gray matter in the brain and such, but I have not really been able to make myself stick with it as a, as a consistent practice in my own life. Um, but I, I feel like the total lack of stimulus that comes in the sensory deprivation tank is kind of like a slingshot into a deeper level of hypnosis because there's or a deeper level of meditation because there's nothing else to pay attention to. It's like you are truly alone with yourself. And um, it, I mean, have, have you have you been in one of these tanks yet? Actually, I haven't. I, I, I booked a session uh not not too long ago but i never did it so far never done it, it, it's worth it. it the thing is it's it's like nothing else i mean you can kind of it, it's it's like talking to a you know 14 year old kid about sex it's like they kind of understand the mechanisms and stuff like that but it until you've done it you don't really know what it is it's like and, and then when you do it you're like oh yeah this is what they were talking about and sensory deprivation tanks and jumping out of airplanes i mean all of these are sort of um one of a kind experiences where once you've done it, you're like, yeah, I, I understand it now. And there, there's nothing else that's quite like what that was. So um, you kind of need to have the experience to be able to, to get the full understanding. Um, but yeah, I, th I think it's well worth doing. Some people, it, it's well worth trying. Some people really like it. Some people really, really, really dislike it and um, kind of don't like being alone with themselves in that way. But um, yeah, I'm one of the folks that, that really likes it. I just think that there's a, a heck of a lot to potentially be gained by shutting out the world and, and seeing what your brain does when left to its own devices. All right. Well, I'm excited to try it out. And uh, well, now moving on to our topic for today, which is, well, this concept that everyone has an opinion and, and experiences with, which is love. And 
yeah maybe a, a, bit, a bit of a an anecdote or the the story how it became the topic because when i thought about topics for you um well obviously smart drugs and different drugs to to have more attention focus and flow and memory uh crossed my mind and then we just had valentine's day so some listeners who listen to that at, at a later point they might have to yeah. know that and i had a really rough emotional valentine's day that i already told you about uh where i pretty much broke up with my girlfriend then got back together and then we ended up being on some sort of relationship uh pause and it was just a, an emotional roller coaster and it showed me again that on a neurochemical level this thing we call love or being in love being attached is so powerful and it can throw yeah. you into flow it can create total chaos and disaster and havoc and and make your life beautiful and, and and productive and creative and that's why i asked you i wrote you an email and said hey jesse what do you think about that and you said short answer yes Let's do it. I, I even did yes in all caps. That's how emphatic I was. Exactly. I, I, fig I figure nobody's going to ask me in my entire life to to be an expert on love. And and since you uh, somehow stepped into that bear trap, I had to take you up on it. <laughs> Fantastic. And now I'm excited because love is a drug. And uh, I, I wanted to start off maybe with that question. Do you, in your opinion, do you think it's harder today now with this access to not only technology, but also smart drugs and different stimuli in the environment, that it's harder to maybe fall in love or stay in love? I, I, I think the short answer is yes. I mean, I'm not sure if it's a problem that we have today specifically. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, the, they've done those studies on decision making. And like when you give a person a choice of three jellies, they pick their favorite jelly. And when you give them a choice of 30 jellies, they're like, ah, and just kind of freak out because even though we think we want more options, sometimes you just, you know, there's more options than you can analyze and we get into, uh, you know, what what's called analysis paralysis and just don't make a decision at all. And I feel like, you know, as people have moved from, you know, small towns where you've maybe got access to, you know, 30 marriageable age women within 50 miles of you. And so you got to choose one of those 30, you know, if you're growing up, you know, 200 years ago in a, in a you know, rural America or something, or now if you live in a city of, you know, even, even a modest sized city of like, you know, 100,000, 200,000 people, you know, within, uh, you know, spitting distance of you. And in fact, you know, probably at your computer on match.com or whatever it is like laid out for you, just, you know, and screen after screen after screen are all these potential mates. And, um, it, it's just hard, I think, given the the innumerable possibilities out there to say, OK, this person's perfect. I'm going to just go with this one and stick with it. It's, I, I feel like that's a bigger hump to get over with um, all the choices that we have arrayed for us now than it was when we just had less choices. Totally. My mom always uh, used to say, she said, she said, well, you had to choose someone at the local firefighter stands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, it really would have made things simpler. It, it, it somehow is. But I also somehow think that in, in, in addition to this analysis paralysis and this, these billions of, of options that we have, that somehow we uh, have maybe altered our brain chemistry in a way where also we might not produce. And this is just a hypothesis right now for me. But no. I heard John Gray, the author of uh, Men Are From Mars, Women are from Venus. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's exa exact. I translated that title from German, uh, but he talked about the effect that media and little dopamine surges of YouTube, sure. just YouTube videos that you watch, have on your oxytocin production. And uh, without going now too far into that subject, but do you know anything about what happens exactly in the brain when when you fall in love? What kind of chemicals are released? Maybe we should start off with that. Yeah, I, I, th I think it actually, l let's come back to that in a sec. But I, I do want to agree that I think as our whole culture kind of gets shorter attention spans based on, you know, everything that we're exposed to from, you know, age zero onward, I feel like falling deeply in love with somebody kind of requires a concerted attention on that person for a, a big length of time. And, um, and, and so the fact that we're kind of trained to have these, you know, quick, rapid channel change attention spans now 
probably makes it easier to, well, I, I've looked at bachelorette number one, let's move to bachelorette number two, let's move to bachelorette number three. That's kind of what we've been wiring ourselves up for rather than this sustained attention, which would really be better for that, you know, long-term uh, relationship building. That being said, you know, our, our biochemistry is made to help us sustain attention on somebody. You know, I think in the, in the you know, literature on this, they actually call it the love object, which isn't necessarily the most romantic of terminologies, but, but that's what you read sometimes. But like once, once a person has sort of isolated, you know, somebody as their love object, we, we get things like, um, you know, the neurotransmitter dopamine, which are helping us kind of, you know, lock on target for that person. And all of a sudden, you know, in the, in the early stages of love, you know, our life, our attention, all sorts of sort of reframes itself around this, you know, one person that's kind of center screen for us. And, you know, we, we see a crowd and we'll, we'll, oh, that person looks kind of like, you know, the girl that I'm interested in, even if it's not the girl or, you know, you, you, see a new movie and you're like, oh, I wonder how she would like it and things like that. Your your whole um, sort of frame of reference becomes it, like weirdly linked to this this one other human. Um, mm -hmm. But as, as far as the chemicals that are involved in love, uh, there, there are, are kind of three of them. I mean, there are probably more than three, but the big ones seem to be dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter involved in both reward and, and probably more so motivation, kind of getting you off your lazy duff to do stuff. Dopamine is, is key in that. Um, there's oxytocin, which people have you know probably heard of. It's called the, uh, the love drug or the cuddle drug or the snuggle drug, depending on who you ask. Um, but this is one of these ones that's, uh, it, it's a major hormone for the, um, actually, I think it might not be a hormone, but, uh, it's a major chemical involved in mother-child bonding. Like when a woman gives birth, there's this, I think that's the most oxytocin that ever hits any human ever is uh, what hits a woman directly, you know, during and after childbirth to kind of force chemically bonding with her new baby. Mm -hmm. And and then another um, chemical called vasopressin, which uh, again, I would want to ask a biochemist about the the differences, but vasopressin and oxytocin are very closely chemically related to one another. And vasopressin does a lot of things within the body, including sort of maintaining our optimal level of water. Like if you're getting dehydrated, it keeps you from peeing as much, but it also seems to have a lot to do with pair bonding and love in mammals and, and also memory. So kind of, um, you know, forming memories about the person that you're pair bonding with and all of these things, you know, the oxytocin, the vasopressin, the dopamine, they kind of tie together, um, you know, in, in the course of actually going through a love relationship. You know, you you snuggle with somebody, maybe you have sex with somebody, you get this massive release of oxytocin. That feels really good. The vasopressin helps you remember it. And and meanwhile, uh, you know, the dopamine that's been motivating you to, you know, probably hop into bed with them to begin with. Um, one of the things that dopamine is is really tied up with is learning. And you think, well, okay, well, what's learning have to do with, with love? But but actually, when you kind of peel back the onion skin, learning has a hell of a lot to do with love. Because when you're first getting into a romantic relationship, it's like, what do you kind of need to do? You, you need to reorganize your life so you can spend as much time with this person as possible. You need to find out what this person's likes and dislikes are so you can sort of, you know, maximize how attractive you're going to be to this person to make them want to spend time with you. And, and so... Um, I think probably during the early stages of love, especially dopamine is really, really prevalent, which is why people kind of get, you know, hyperactive and, and just, you know, want to talk and think about their loved one, you know, even to third parties, you know, all the time. Um, they're really motivated to do things. And they're also, their brain is, is literally getting ready to redraw its neural pathways so you can build new habits that are, are centered around working this person into your life. Wow, this is very well explained. Does does the dopamine surge also explain the increased physical performance? Because I noticed when I was actually in college, my, my first real love in college, and I played basketball for Boston University then, and uh, my physical performance skyrocketed. Like I could jump out of the gym. Yeah. I've never dunked harder than when when I was <laughs> in love with that girl. Does that is that also related to the dopamine? You think?
Yeah, well, I mean, dopamine is associated with a lot of drugs that we think of as stimulants. So, you know, everything from the amphetamines, uh, like, you know, like methamphetamine or uh, Adderall or, um, you know, methylphenidate, which is known as Ritalin. Um, you know, all of these are, are stimulant drugs. And one of the primary effects that they have is to really upregulate the level of dopamine. Some of them do that by actually making you secrete more dopamine. Others just uh, kind of keep your brain from erasing dopamine, taking it off the table after it's been released. But but either way, you kind of get more dopamine in circulation with these stimulants. And, and they're physical stimulants as well, too. Um, so so it, it does kind of make sense that anything that's going to promote dopamine would probably at, at least correlate with physical stimulation, too. In, in, in motivation, certainly. Right. And then uh, obviously tied to that, there is a release of endorphins. And well, dopamine is also very important in that flow cycle. So after you have mm -hmm. that nitric oxide release and then you release stress hormone, then it's usually dopamine and endorphins that, that come in and, and get your focus into, yeah. into flow mode. Uh, so it, I think it, it just overly has an effect on that. And by the way, because you mentioned some drugs related to dopamine, but is there, do you know of any oxytocin or vasopressin drugs by just, just came into my mind? Um, you know, oxytocin actually does cross the blood brain barrier, although not very effectively, or like, I, I think the amount that you need to, uh, to inhale is typically the way that it's delivered in order to get it across, um, it is, is pretty, pretty large concentrations. So, um, you know, oxytocin is one of these things that you can Google around, like, you know, oxytocin perfumes and things like that. And they're out there. People sell this stuff. It's pretty much a marketing gimmick because, you know, it, it, unless you're drinking from the bottle or something or like licking the perfume off somebody, <laughs> you're not gonna, you're not going to get a biologically active amount of, of oxytocin that's making it from somebody else's perfume into your brain. Okay. Um, but you know, un unlike some things which are sort of filtered out at the blood-brain barrier, oxytocin in, in small dribs and drabs actually can cross it um, you know, in its form as oxytocin. Um, I'm not sure. God, we, we had an oxytocin episode, and I, I wish I remembered the answer to that. I, I don't feel like there's anything that you can you know, eat, like you know, magical vegetables or anything like that, that would um, – necessarily make your body endogenously produce more oxytocin. But um, I, I would actually, I, I'll re re refer back to the Smart Drug Smarts library on that one, because we did have a Know Your Neurotransmitters episode on oxytocin. Uh, my memory is just not fresh no, on it at the moment. Awesome. I'll link to that, actually. But do you think that's, I always, almost consider that ethically, uh, well, in, in the gray area, if, if you talk about perfumes, infused with, with oxytocin that will work that is that is like manipulating on a, on a high level yeah but i mean sort Another of person. but i mean th no. that's people people do that all the time i mean like is, is it unethical for a woman to wear uh you know makeup is it is it unethical <laughs> for her to dress up nicely I, and I'm, I'm saying women i mean men do the same thing i mean is it unethical for a guy with like you know big biceps to wear like a you know a, a muscle t-shirt no, it's like, it's like we're, we're, yeah. we're constantly trying to do things to uh you know impress other mates with our our viability and charm and stuff like that. That's right. Yeah. No, it's, but th th this obviously would, if that would really work, then uh, that would be a, a next level kind of hack. Because if you go to a club, you already, it's dark, you know, you have perfume, you have the, the well, the, the social drugs. Um, well, yeah, but, but how, like, you know, let's, let's say that you're in a club with the girl and, and she's just slathered herself in oxytocin and it's wafting off of her onto you. And it's, you know, you're getting, biologically active amounts. I mean, there's still nothing that's like going to, hopefully if you're looking at her, maybe it works, but I mean, it, you, you might look at, you know, the girl that's sitting at the table behind her think, wow, she's attractive. And all of a sudden the girl sitting across from you is delivering the oxytocin, but meanwhile, your attention <laughs> is somewhere else. So it could backfire. Oh yeah, very much so. It's, it's like, I, I remember, God, I, I, I wish I knew the study on this one better, but it, there are a lot of, um, like, you know, so, some of these studies uh, on, 
on trying to rewire homosexuals, thinking, oh, well, maybe they don't have enough. Uh, I think it was testosterone. Like maybe male homosexuals don't have enough testosterone and that's why they're attracted to men. And so they, they tried to give these guys more testosterone. Of course, what happened is they just got even more attracted to men. Uh, it, it wasn't that they were lacking testosterone. It's just like, you know, they, they were you know, kind of, you know, their brain was aimed a different direction. And, and by giving more fuel in the tank, it, it propelled them even further in that direction. So, it, it, yeah, it's, it's just funny the way that some of those things um, wow. are wired up. So, so these powerful chemicals, they're obviously present in, right from the beginning. And then at some point they start, well, before we talk maybe about the later stage, at this stage, is there already a difference between men and women as far as the neurochemicals are concerned? You, you know, from what I've read on it, and, you know, of course, I, I'm not an expert. I'm just you know, somebody that tries to read up on what the experts have to say. It seems like there's there's actually way less difference than you would think as far as what happens neurochemically with men and women in their feelings of love. They've, they've done a lot of studies where... Um, They, they've sort of tried to sex blind the um, the answers that people give on like you know, written questionnaires and stuff like that, and um, and then see if people reading it can can guess the sex of the person who answered the questions. And most of the time, it is really tough to tell. They, they've even done studies where men and women describe um, describe you know the act of sex, you know what it's like to have sex with somebody as far as the physical feelings, but they you know d delete the word like you know penis and vagina and vulva and things like that and, and make make th those N nouns ambiguous, but just describe like the sensations. And, um, and, and again, researchers can hardly tell the difference at all between what was written by a man, what was written by a woman. So it's, it seems like we're awfully similar, um, you know, in most regards, as far as, you know, how we feel romantically. Um, there, there was one, you know, before we talked, I, I knew we were going to be talking about love and romance. And so, um, one thing that I saw that was an interesting study was, Uh, researchers were, gave people the uh, the statement, you know, the best thing about love is sex. And and the vast majority of both men and women disagreed with that. 95% of females disagreed with that. 91% of males disagreed with that. So you, you could see like, you know, a, a little difference, but it's, it's only a difference of 4% wow. um, you know, between men and women. Wow. And, 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 and that's one of the areas that like kind of colloquially – You know, you ask the man on the street, you know, what are one of the big differences that, you know, men and women, um, you know, it, one, of, one of the big differences that you see between men and women in relationships and you say, oh, well, men are way more sex motivated. And but according to, to this, no, not really. Actually, it just an, another question just popped my mind. And uh, yeah. I don't know if you know anything about that, but uh, and we might have to put a disclaimer before that episode now, but I heard that direct contact of sperm with the interior of uh, of the woman for example would oh, yeah. enhance the the surge in neurochemicals is that do you know anything about that y yeah we, we <laughs> this is a really interesting area um it, it's not sperm um per se like but it you know semen the the ejaculate has all sorts of um You know, biologically active compounds in it. And, it, you know, at first it was kind of thought that, well, this is just like a, a slip and slide for sperm to go swimming through. It's like a, a you know, a surface for them to swim on or whatever. And, and maybe has some food in it to keep them, you know, having some, some glucose to feed while their, their little tails are wagging. It, it turns out that it's probably a, a massive chemical barrage for the woman also meant to, you know, affect her behavior, you know, and, and kind of get her addicted potentially to that male. And, and certainly to identify things, um, you know, very much the way that smells can, like, is this guy maybe too closely related to me? I shouldn't be attracted to him because we're going to have, you know, a baby that has, um, you know, difficulties just because we're, we're too genetically identical. Um, th they haven't done a hell of a lot of research into this, given, given what an interesting topic it is. It hasn't been researched as much as one would like. Um, but Yeah, back in the Smart Drug Smarts library, I feel like it was in the 90s, like episode 95 or somewhere around there. Um, I, I did an interview with a guy who you know has studied the effects of semen on the human female other than pregnancy, like the psychological effects. And it's it's really, really fascinating. Some of the studies that they've done on um, you know groups of women who are in apparently identical relationships, except that some of them are using condoms when they have sex and others don't. And 
just the, the mere semen exposure versus non-semen exposure, you know, factoring out things like how long have they been with their boyfriend, how committed do they feel to the relationship, blah, blah, blah. You know, semen exposures it made a difference on quite a few, uh, um, you know, statistically significant findings. Okay, wow. That's that's also really interesting. And it's another topic that I'd love to dig in more. And I also wonder, though, how all, all, all of this then relates to to that later phase because in the honeymoon phase i guess it's at least i can only speak from my experience but you know it's everything yeah. is easy for about four or five months that's my experience i don't know if it's for others is longer well, but, but, well easy yeah but you're, you're also like kind of like jittery and wound up and, and kind of like you know nervous anticipation like you know b before you go on stage at a you know to sing or something like that so i i, I feel yes. like easy is not the right word no no you're Good, right yes you know no you're right you're right and there's the anxiety and obviously you know the uh, missing someone and Uh, and different feelings that are not very positive. Yeah, and be being in love is not always good either, I think. But it's it's sort of where things between the partners somehow, if they're if they both fall in love, then it's it's this process where both have these chemicals, and I think it carries them on. And then yeah. there comes this point where you either go long term or, or you decide not to. I guess right. And uh, I, I'm at this point right now, I guess, because I just I don't understand it very well. And that, that's why I'd, I'd like to maybe explore it a little more. Like what, how, so these chemicals wear off and, uh, or is it that dopamine goes down, but oxytocin needs to stay high in order to, to make the step? Or is it environmental factors? I'm sorry, I'm like bombarding you now with this question, which is not really a yes. specific question. But do you right. have any th th thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I suspect that probably dopamine over the course of a, a, a long term relationship, you know, as you, as you go past like the one, two, three year mark, probably probably the dopamine drops and it probably has a lot to do with with that. Um, you know, we don't need to be like massively learning new things at that point that we've we've sort of integrated the person into our lifestyle and our routines and those new neural pathways that needed to be laid at the beginning of the relationship. Presumably they have been laid by that point and are pretty like well entrenched. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if, if one has been having a successful relationship for a while, you've had this cycle of, you know, doing things, going through that learning process, getting the positive rewards of, you know, oxytocin and vasopressin to help lock in that learning. Um, and, and, you know, kind of deeply, you know, again, to kind of like use the metaphor of, of laying like, you know, ruts in a track or something, you've got like these deeply grooved neural pathways now. Um, and, and then I guess if you start to go through a rocky period in the relationship or the person, you know, goes away for a long time and you're, you're just not able to kind of physically get exposed to this person who's now become like a, a, a habit trigger for you, then all of a sudden you're not able to, um, you know, go through these habits you're used to. And, and You know, I, I feel like all of us are sort of creatures of habit to a large degree. And, um, you know, any, any, any major habit that you try to shed is going to create anxiety and discomfort, whether that's, you know, not having a person in your life or, you know, not being able to eat the food that you're used to eating or, or any of those things. But, um, but yeah, love seems to be a, <laughs> a particularly egregious offender when it comes to making us uncomfortable uh, about things because we're, we're getting a lot of probably positive neurochemicals taken away all at once. It's like the dopamine, it's like we, I, we don't have, I, I think the giant surging dopamine late in the relationship that we did at the beginning, but we are kind of used to getting like little dopamine hits for when, when we do the right things, you know, we get our girlfriend to smile at us or, you know, wh whatever it is. It's like, we, we're kind of getting these little jelly beans of dopamine throughout the day. And when those stop coming, it, it really can be painful. That's it. And, and, and these neural pathways, I think that's a super interesting concept because it kind of proposes that it might be able to, in, in a way, hack that process, optimize that process of laying the foundation uh, in, in a neurochemical way. Because I think if you let it happen, and maybe uh, oftentimes it's, it's based on, uh, maybe it is the, the environment, for example, long distance, I, I assume, could create quite some trouble. Sure. Well, uh, I mean, long distance relationships are easy or are not easy. And I think anybody that's ever been in one will attest to that. Yeah, I've been in, in, in one. And yeah, it's well at, at a later point, actually, which is a bit easier. But I think starting off with one could be could be quite dangerous. Well, now we, we 
we are pretty much at that point, let's say that, uh, and it happens more than 50% now, at least I think in Germany and I think in the US as well, that uh, couples and even married couples split up. And we, I guess most of us have been through that and it does feel that you're sort of getting off a drug because you have these really strong withdrawal symptoms, you know, from right. physical pain to emotional instability to you can't even, you can almost get a sick day because of, after a breakup you're not able to to do anything oh yeah how how is how can you explain that uh another study that i looked up this was on 114 men and women who had been uh dumped by a partner within the past eight weeks 40 percent of those people in, experienced clinically measurable depression so you know they, they could have gone in and gotten you know prescribed whatever it is for actually being clinically depressed so yeah, that that is no it's no small thing. Um, and yeah, some some of the signs of drug withdrawal that kind of link up with with breakup withdrawal uh, you know, are protest, crying spells, lethargy, anxiety, sleep disturbances, loss of appetite, or binge eating. So opposite ends of the spectrum there, uh, irritability, and chronic loneliness. So a a pretty uh, you know shitty mishmash of potential symptoms. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel like the parallels with um, you know addiction to a substance are, are, are like an exogenous substance are really, really strong um, as far as people doing whatever they can, like you know bargaining and, and you know trying to make you know, basically make, making bad deals in other areas of their life to see what they can do to get you know, the, the object of their affection or their drug of addiction back into their life, you know, people doing, doing stupid stuff. I mean, you know, there, there's all the, you know, movies and stories of drug addicts, you know, stealing from family members and, uh, you know, holding up liquor stores or whatever it is to, to try to, you know, get money for their next hit. And there's, you know, kind of parallel stories of people doing all sorts of stupid stuff to win their, their former lover back, um, you know, well past the point where it, it should be pretty clear to everybody, in, including themselves, that, it's, it's not going to work and that, you know, it's time to give up the ghost on that. But, um, yeah, people just don't, uh, don't terribly, don't think clearly at those moments, myself included. <laughs> it's like, I, I've certainly been down that road. Right. Yeah. And I think it even goes a, a step further than, than just the, the chemicals that you produce maybe on a daily basis. Like you, what you said, you know, when you make your girlfriend smile, for example, you get the little dopamine surge, but it's, it seems to be at a, at a sub level where, you know that your partner is there and even for example if you're on, on vacation you can't reach each other for a couple of weeks but you know right. that partner is with you and probably thinking about you that's enough to keep you stable right. but then it could be that you just saw it was perfect the day before and the next day so, sort of well you you break up and then you're you're destroyed yeah and it's it's somehow this this deeper. It's I, I'm, I think it has nothing to do with rational thinking anymore. It's it's. Well, I I, th I think that one of the big things there is um what they call intrusive thoughts that to to a certain extent you know we we've got very good imaginations as human beings, and we're able to you know if things are going well like even if like let's say our girlfriend's away on you know vacation for the next month and we're not going to see her but you know we can quickly you know call a picture of her to mind in our, in our memory and think everything's cool and, and kind of give yourself that little hit of dopamine just from your own memory and imagination and, and kind of, you know, keep, keep your relationship on, on biochemical life support in that way. Whereas if, if the opposite happens, like, it, you know, maybe she's in the next room, but you just had a big fight and all of a sudden you start having these thoughts about, Oh, you know, the, the relationship relationship is going to hell. Um, and, and, and that's the kind of thing that you're, uh, you know, ruminating on and, and these thoughts just keep coming back into your head. You're, you're giving yourself, you know, the opposite, like the, these, um, all this can just be done internally. It, it, it's not like a drug in that there needs to be an external supply of this stuff. We have such, um, you know, amazing ability to, you know, make up and tell, tell ourselves stories in our own heads that depending on the nature of those stories, we can get very different, um, you know, biochemical results. If you could hack, uh, let's say, hypothetically, I know you're in a very stable, healthy relationship right now, but... Uh, Sigh of relief. <laughs> think back when it, when it wasn't like that. 
uh, if you had the possibilities maybe that you had now and uh, would you hack the time after a breakup in, in a certain way and if yes then how okay well th yeah that's, that's a great question that's a really good question um the, the, the probably best relationship advice I ever got wasn't really intended to be advice but it was something that was offhandedly said by one of my friend's dads when I was probably like 19 years old and he said you know the only way to you know, he's like this you know gruff curmudgeonly dude and he was just like the only way to get over a woman is the next woman <laughs> and, and, and like to a certain extent I think that that is is very valid even even at a chemical level in that, um, you know, if we go back to what dopamine is doing at the beginning of a relationship and it's it's priming the brain for learning, it's saying, you know, you've, you've got a bunch of new stuff you've got to learn and lay down some new habits fast. And part of learning is, of course, laying down new th new uh, new pathways within your brain. But part of it's also like tearing up the old roads and, and um, you know, allowing things to change. I mean, you've you've got your 80 billion neurons or whatever, uh, but Part, part of the brain is, is always doing this pruning process and the pathways that aren't getting used, they get pruned kind of, you know, out with the old in with the new. And so um, I kind of feel like maybe the hack for a breakup would be anything that could really upregulate your dopamine, um, you know, whether that's the next woman or the next whatever, but something that can help you quickly um, start rewiring your brain and laying down neural pathways so you won't be kind of trying to go down these same uh, behavioral tracks that you've laid that, you know, you don't have the dopamine of the girlfriend's smile or, you know, the sex or the whatever waiting for you at the end. It's like, because, you know, that that's what hurts after a breakup is like you're you're trying to complete these behavior circuits that have led to rewards in the past, but because the object of your affection is no longer there, you're going to go down and do the habit and there's no reward at the end. You want to be able to lay down some new habit tracks. So, um, you know, my, my off the cuff answer is that anything that you could do to, you know, stimulate the release of more dopamine, be that artificially or not, would probably be helpful in that it would allow you to, you know, rewire your own behavior. Now, of course, the, 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 there's so many grains of salt that need to be added here. The big caveat is, if you're putting your brain in a, in a good learning state to lay down new habits, you want to be very sure that the habits you're laying down are good. You don't want to like, now I'm going to lay down the habits of being an obsessive stalker, you know, because you can see somebody like doing that too. And, and, you know, probably many people do. It's like, you don't want to be, okay, my new habit is that I'm going to be hiding outside her window at night, looking at her and her new boyfriend, plotting on how to kill them. It's like, you know, that, that can go bad places fast. Um, but uh, that. Actually brings me to my next question, which would be if both partners now are, well, willing, let's say they hit a roadblock and they're willing to, to try another time. And then it sounds to me that this dopamine strategy could also work maybe if, if both partners created activities or habits together that would have them create dopamine pretty much for each other or induce the dopamine production in each other. Sure. I mean, I, I, I think that um, if, if both partners have the same motivations and are willing to work together, I mean, the sky's the limit. There's nothing you can't do. But uh, that, you know, that can be a tough road to hoe to get two people on the same page in that way. Yeah, actually, I have a friend who started a, an app here in Germany to uh, well help people with the relationship struggle. And he had a couple of studies that... If people would go, I think it's an amazingly high number, if uh, people will go to a therapist after a certain time being together, obviously, and hitting the first roadblock, which pretty much every relationship does, before breaking up, and they would just make the decision, okay, before we break up, we see a therapist, then 80% of these relationships would, would survive at least for a couple more years or something like that. Wow. It's pretty high. So oftentimes it's this this third person in the room, or sometimes it's like four people, um, well, yeah. well, two therapists, um, they sort of act as a, as a mirror uh, and they, mm -hmm. they take the, they, they called it, I think the relationship garbage out of the, of the room yeah. and then had the people be opposite of each other as human beings again with, um, without all this emotional garbage. There's a really interesting statistic that I read a long time ago. I forget what study this is from, but 
it, this is not a, um, a prescriptive, but sort of an analytical way of looking at relationships, but that if people have five times as many good experiences together as they do bad experiences and just keep the ratio five to one or better, couples stay together, like, you know, 80% likelihood. And if it drops below five to one, they like 80% split up. So it doesn't necessarily say how to hit that ratio. And that's, that's a pretty good mark, but, um, but yeah, there does seem to be kind of a metric there, where if your if your positive feedback eclipses your negative feedback by a certain ratio, then then your relationship can can weather almost any storm. Right. Wow. Well, yeah, we are in territory now, which is a bit dangerous because everyone you know is is in it as well, and so we are yeah. carefully treading here. But actually, there was one interesting thing I came across, which is, is and this sort of goes back to the, the um, you know, morphology of the brain. But there is something called hypopituitarism, which uh, it comes from the, uh, the pituitary, pituitary uh, gland within the brain. And this is a rare disease where the pituitary gland doesn't work quite like it normally should. But in, in, in those people, and this is a, you know, a small fraction of the population, but they are sometimes what's called love blind in that they never get like the surging dopamine and like the, you know, I love you, I adore you, I'll do anything for you feelings. And, and, and they also don't have like the, the nasty crash on breakups. Um, most of the time they'll still you know, have relationships, still get married, you know, still kind of lead normal lives, but, you know, kind of marrying just more out of like convenience and companionship, not because they have like this drug like, you know, just yearning, lusting, crave for another person that is sort of the norm for the human species. Okay, and that's called hypothyroid, uh, uh, hypopituitarism, hypo and it, it does other things besides that, but I thought that the love blindness was an interesting little fallout. Oh, that's very interesting. I'm going to look that up and link to that. And uh, yeah, actually, that brings me to my next question, because that was about epi epigenetics, and I, I read also in preparation for the, this podcast, that people that have traumatic experiences early in their life um, with bonding, for example, uh, apparently males who have uh, difficult relationships with their mothers who, who were rejected after birth, uh, that they can't produce very much oxytocin, for example. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not... Really that, that sounds highly plausible to me. I mean, like, I, I don't know anything about it other than what you just said, but that certainly sounds reasonable. Yeah, I also just yeah. read a, a couple articles in, in that direction and Googled oxytocin and, and read whatever I could find. But then that that seemed quite plausible. But yeah, let's also, this this would be something for an expert to really maybe say how someone who knows that he or she has bonding issues, how they could potentially deal with that better or even hack that, maybe even using some sort of, well, we've talked about some of the drugs with, for um, also oxytocin release, and you said you could, could inhale it potentially. By the way, is there, have you ever tried it? Uh, inhaling oxytocin? I haven't, no. I, I got some vasopressin, um, and this was a couple of years ago just to try to use – or actually it was a synthetic analog called desmopressin, which is supposed to be basically the same thing but a little bit more um, just you know biologically active. Um, just to try to use it to see if it could improve my memory. It's got a very short half-life. So it's not something where you take a little bit and you're you know, on it for the next five hours or whatever. It breaks down within in your body. It's like got a half-life of you know 20 minutes or something like that. Um, I, I, I didn't notice a hell of a lot from it. I couldn't say that I learned more on that day than on any other day. All right. Uh, and actually, okay, one more topic uh, on this subject before I want to ask you a couple more questions relating more to, to your personal experiences. But one subject I got interested in after listening to your podcast episode about it was the influence of porn. Uh, oh yeah, on, on people, and that was highly interesting. And uh, I actually thought it's super relevant because uh, maybe to summarize that episode of what, what I've gotten is that it really creates an addiction in, especially well, in, in males and females, and it uh, creates an, a, a perverse version of the idea of sex in a way that manipulates people into engaging in, in, in sexual activities and relationship activities that they actually don't really want, but they were taught by porn. 
Yeah, that that was a fascinating episode, and I, I feel like it's it's a really interesting topic and sort of like a public health issue that isn't isn't being taken nearly as seriously as it probably should. Kind of like when um, you know, we started shifting our diets to eating huge amounts of corn syrup in like the late seventies and early nineteen eighties, and and nobody was like really thinking about what the long term consequences of like all this corn sugar going into us constantly might be. I, I kind of feel like the um. You know, the, the introduction of broadband porn in you know the late 90s, early 2000s, whenever that is, is probably another one of these things. They're just kind of like snuck into the culture without anybody's really intending to, uh, to, to be making big changes in the way humans operate without thinking about what the long-term consequences might be. Um, Could you mention maybe the, it, the biggest danger that you've taken away from that episode or the, the biggest well, takeaway? Yeah, I mean, kind of, kind of the gist of it is there, there are... Um, you know, periods where the, the, um, you know, the, the brain is like learning incredibly quickly, you know, all throughout, you know, up until, you know, figure age 25 or whatever, our brain is constantly kind of changing and rewiring itself, trying to get itself, you know, fit for adulthood. And, um, you know, particularly, you know, during in, in puberty, you know, start, starting at puberty as people start getting, you know, sexual feelings and attracted to, you know, whomever they're going to be attracted to or whatever they're going to be attracted to. There's um, you know, a period where the brain is sort of wiring itself up to be a sexual creature, which, you know, little kids aren't, adults are. And, and um, you know, whatever sort of your, your first experiences are that give you those initial dopamine hits, you start laying down neural pathways, just like, you know, you do, you do with anything else you're learning. And of course, because, you know, sex is one of the most motivating things that there are for any, any species. It's like those, those are particularly important neural pathways. And if you're, you know, living on the plains of the Serengeti a hundred thousand years ago, chances are that your first sexual experiences were with another, you know, young creature of your species. But nowadays, you know, the person's first sexual experiences might, you know, many, many, many times over before they ever interact with another you know, member of the species might be with their computer screen. Screen. And so they're, they're getting these massive hits of dopamine at a, at a point where their brain is is trying actively. Your, your you know epigenetics are saying, "Hey, you're 14 years old. No, now is the time to be learning about sex." And and you know the first you know 10,000 sexual experiences you have might be with your computer screen. And and so your brain's getting really really good at having that you know quote unquote relationship with you know broadband porn rather than with another member of your own species. And so by the time you finally get around to you know maybe getting your first girlfriend or whatever and and um, you know starting to interact sexually with a member of your own species, it's it's like you've been you know, training to go to the Olympics as a bobsledder and all of a sudden they give you a basketball and expect you to dunk. And you're like, what, what the hell is this basketball? Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like um, you know, I, I'm 40 years old. So, like, I, I, I feel like I'm lucky in that I was a little bit like I was I was already past that, like sexual training point by the time the Internet porn got you know as good as it is now. And now it's kind of too good for its own good. And I feel like the um, you know people that are you know a half a generation behind me, it's like I kind of feel bad for them because they've got this, um, you know, just this temptation that, you know, what 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 kind of, you know, 15 year old boy isn't going to be interested in that. And yet it's training their brain in probably fundamentally the wrong things. Right, and uh, you know, I have the I'm, I'm 32 and have the uh, similar uh, view on that as you have because I wasn't really. Uh, it has developed so much ever since we were young, so I think I, I, I missed that period. Fortunately, um, yeah, I mean, we we had you know Playboy and stuff like that, but it's just it's exactly sort of an order an order of magnitude tamer. And we're sort of lacing up to topics now um, here, and the one we talked about earlier uh, with with this dopamine search and also training people to have more options because i think what i've gotten away from your episode as well is that especially young teenage boys for example are trained that uh, i'm attracted to this porn star for example right now while i'm w watching porn but the next day i'm watching a different porn star and a different porn star and a different right woman and then i'm sort of training myself to only be turned on by new options that creates a, a bigger mm -hmm. dopamine surge and not by the same person anymore. And maybe like going back to the beginning of this episode, uh, that could explain why people have so much trouble sticking with one thing because they're trained to get more options. Uh, I, I think that's, that's absolutely valid. I, I think there's also, you know, the huge uh, point that, you know, 
porn is a one way street. It's like you don't have to do anything to keep, you know, pornography happy. Whereas a girlfriend, you you have to do all kinds of stuff to keep her happy. It's it's like it's a, you know, it's a dialogue rather than a monologue. And, um, you know, there's nothing really required from you, uh, you know, in, in porn. It's like there, there's no feedback. There's no feedback, good or bad, except for, you know, your own, you know, orgasm and oxytocin release and stuff like that. So I guess there, there's positive feedback. There's no negative feedback. Whereas, you know, trying to stumble through your relationships will always have negative feedback as well as positive feedback. And, and th- those are all learning experiences. So you can find out what, what does it take to keep my loved one happy? And so you're right. You're, um, the novelty thing is a big one because, you know, porn gives access to novelty that, that real human relationships don't. And the, the lack of feedback and, and just not needing to compensate for somebody else's desires, I think, is, is another huge difference. Yeah. And in addition to that, uh, and I got that from John Gray, he said that mm-hmm. that novelty without feedback doesn't induce an oxytocin release. So by watching porn, you get dopamine, but you don't get the oxytocin. According to him. yeah, that, that that would that would make sense. So and also and that's why you learn when when let's say a young teenage guy watches a lot of porn that he wouldn't get the dop- the he would get the dopamine without the oxytocin, and then later when he has watched I don't know you know ten thousand hours and, and then meets for the first time a real woman then also the oxytocin is not produced. <laughs> I love that you picked 10,000 hours because that makes him a, uh, <laughs> an official expert according to uh, Malcolm Gladwell on porn. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, th- I think that's why I said it too. But okay, but that, that actually uh, could explain it. So our environment is shaping, I think, the, the way we, we have relationships. And I think that could explain why people are jumping around way more. Maybe it's in our circles as well, but I feel like, uh, well, the concept of open relationships and switching partners uh, is is increasing every year almost. Yeah, I mean, it, it's there are so many massive level sociological experiments going on right now that it, it's tough to say where one starts and the other stops because, you know, Th- things like Uber are affecting the way that we date. I mean, like everything affects everything else. And so it's, it's really, um, it's tough to draw a nice little experimental box around these things. Um, but, but yeah, I, th- I think there can be no question that, you know, epigenetically s- social norm wise, you know, all these things, we are, we are definitely changing the expected behaviors of, of humans. And, um, I don't think I don't think there's anything we can do to put that genie back in the bottle. I mean, I, I I wouldn't want to roll back society to where it was 50 years ago or whatever. I think that's, um, you know, a impossible and b a, not a, not a good idea for all sorts of reasons. But it, you know, I totally agree. It's interesting to think from 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 one's own perspective, like learning learning. Um, you know, what the natural inclinations of humans are, where we're deviating from those paths and where within our own, you know, personal lives. And when I say personal, I mean like you, yourself, your family, your immediate friends, um, which I feel like on those sorts of questions is all you can affect. Um, just, just being cognizant of those choices. Like, you know, if, if I were, um, you know, this is going to sound terrible and will piss off some people, but like, you know, if, if I were a girl and I were dating a guy and I found out that he had a terrible relationship with his mom, I, I would just c- cut my losses and get out of the relationship. Like, I, I would just be like, you know what? The, 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 I, the, I'm gambling against myself that this is going to work out well. It might, but like, I've got a 30% better odds with this guy that has a great relationship with his mom. You know what? I'm going with, with a 30% better odds over here. And I just feel like by, by knowing those things, kind of like doing enough research on, you know, sociology, psychology, evolutionary biology, all those things to, um, to kind of know where the odds are, are best laid for you, you know, play the good odds in your own life. Yeah. That's oftentimes, uh, obviously easier said than done especially in, in that in that subject in that area yeah yeah and we were yeah. raised you know with disney and all these romantic uh well ideas that that it's just that there are no rules and uh i think by using probability and using smart drugs and, and chemicals you give them rules and whenever i raise that topic and also a well talk at, at dinners about love on a sort of neurochemical level you you always have these people yeah. that that are not really happy with that conversation so, oh yeah, and people are like, don't don't tell me how it works. It'll it'll ruin the magic. Exactly. So, but 
Jesse, we've I, talked. I, 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 I don't feel like, yeah, no, it, no. We, we can be done. Go, go ahead. Like, I, I just feel like that's fundamentally wrong. I kind of feel like the more, the more expertise somebody gains in something, the more that they tend to appreciate it. And I, I kind of feel like if, if people listening think about that in their own life, it's like, what, what do they have honest to goodness expertise in? And, and does the depth of their knowledge about that subject make it seem more or less amazing to them? I think that the answer is almost always going to be it's more amazing. It's like if, if you talk with a painter about a painting, you're going to see that that painter has like levels of appreciation for the technique and the choice of composition and all these things. Like as, as somebody that just looks at paintings rather than paints them, it's like you would have never even known that like that complexity was down there. But but when they get talking about it, it's like, wow, you can see well, this is a really interesting thing. And I kind of feel like as scientists tease apart what's going on within our brains as we go through the different stages of love and like, you know, what's the biochemical difference between the love a mother feels for her child and the love that you feel for your wife? It's like there, there are these overlaps and then there are these strong differences. And like, isn't that interesting? I kind of feel like um, teasing that stuff apart scientifically will only make us appreciate it more. And it will also make us be able to like diagnose and treat problems that are some of the most misery inducing problems that people face. Yes, and you just said that uh, according to statistics, people get clinically depressed when they break up. So if, obviously it totally makes sense to understand it. And it also yeah. leads me, it reminds me of a quote, by I think it was Mark Twain who said, uh, I don't have enough time to make all my own mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, so that's awesome. You got to learn from from other people's mistakes and or experience in that sense. And that if you understand that, uh, I have a, a better chance in making a relationship work by using a couple of parameters. I think it would make sense. Yeah. But, um, Jesse, I wanted we uh, we've now covered quite a range of of topics on that subject. I think people are gonna really dig this episode. Uh, I wanted to ask you maybe to to wind down. What is the worst relationship advice you've ever gotten? Or it could be any it could be another advice as well. I don't want to put you on. Uh no, that's that's a great question. Um worst relationship advice is to not take into account like what your best friends have to say about your relationship. Um that that like you know, they kind of like go with your gut. Like I feel like If, if your best friends all are like, you know, this this one's not the one for you, it's like, dude, like, l listen to that advice. If they know you well and they know how you were before and after and during the relationship, um, it, it, they're, they're in a better position to make that judgment. So, yeah, I feel like overly relying on your own gut instincts when they are at odds with the people that are close to you, that's a big mistake. All right. Fantastic one. I, I really like that one. And uh, before, I wanted also to say, because in, in Finland, we all had the chance when we were, we were at the Biohacker Summit and uh, the speakers and some of the organizers met after for a retreat in the countryside. Yeah. And they, we were asked what our passion is and why we do what we do. And I remember your answer still. I think it's the only one I really remember because you said, in a world that's getting weirder, I just want to be smart enough to understand it or something like that <laughs> yeah that's uh, that's about right and uh for for my last question i wanted to ask you what exactly did you mean by that i i feel like the world is getting increasingly complex uh and, and that complexity will probably just continue growing and i yeah i, I want to keep my head above water enough to be able to um you know, understand some of the complexity around me. I, th I think that, you know, the world's a fantastically interesting place. I'm deeply curious about a lot of things. And, um, you know, my, my motivation with the whole, you know, how, how to get as smart as you can possibly get stuff is, is really just to make sure that, you know, I, I maintain the ability to keep learning at a rate that, um, you know, satisfies some of my boundless curiosity. Is there a, a limit for you where you would say now I'm, I reached the point where I don't want to go any further. And for example, I could give you a couple examples using uh, robotics or... Oh, like an ethical limit on what I would do to, like, you know, if, if I... Not necessarily ethically, uh, but from a personal 
point of view where you, you'd say I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go that, go that far. I wouldn't do that. And uh, I talked to Demo Arena, the one of the organizers of the Baraka Summit, and for example, he would be willing to replace his eye with with an artificial eye to to see better and and use cyborgism. But is is there somewhere where a limit for you? Um. I, I think it would have to be an, like an extra personal limit. Like I would not, you know, kill a bunch of strangers in order to, you know, upgrade my IQ. I mean, you know, but but as far as like tweaking with my physical body, um, I, I pretty much the sky's the limit. I mean, I would turn into Darth Vader tomorrow if, uh, you know, I, I could push a button and do it. I mean, my, my, my wife would be upset about that. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, hopefully I could get her to turn into Darth Vaderette or something like that. But um. <laughs> Okay, no, that answers it, actually. Yeah, no, I wondered. And I actually got asked that question by a friend who's a fan of your podcast. Um, he said, um, yeah, is there anything you wouldn't do that you've come across that you said, okay, this is too, too much for me? As far as that, I mean, yeah, to that question. I mean, there are a lot of, like, for example, Adderall is one that, despite being deeply curious about it, I've still never tried it myself and probably won't. It just kind of seems like um, some some very tangible upsides are balanced by some equally tangible downsides. And, um, yeah, so, so it, it's, if the checks and balances don't balance out, then I won't do it. But, like, if something seems like a net positive to me, um to, as far as what it does to the brain, like I would be willing to trade some hits to my body for some benefits to my brain, because I feel like the brain is the most complex system and is the only one that you know, 20 years from now, I'm going to be able to buy like a new lung on Amazon. Like I, I'm just convinced that, you know, oh shit, my lung went out. Uh, okay, well, I'll order a new one and it'll cost a couple thousand bucks, but I'll, I'll be able to get something that will be functionally equivalent. And the brain is going to be like, you know, the last organ we can do that with. And it's also the organ that tends to, um, you know, it, define who we feel like we are. Um, it, some might argue that the gut microbiome is really well tied in there too. So, you know, maybe I'll have like my, my brain and my gut in jars and the rest of it will be this robotic aperture. But um, well, yeah, uh, I, I guess that's my answer there. That's, uh, and, and maybe maybe the eye, if uh, we take Jack Cruz's mo most important organ, because he says we, we wouldn't be able to tell time. Time is created by, in, in part with the eye, not only the brain. Yeah, yeah, I guess the timekeeping. But there's there's a bunch of blind people who can probably uh, you know show up for meetings on time pretty well. No, but it's actually um, interesting because I asked them that question, and if they're blind not only anteriorly but in, in the posterior, then they do have trouble telling time. Yeah, yeah, I, I've heard that as well. Uh, I have heard that. But anyways, that's that's pretty much off topic. Now, okay, the very, very last question, Jesse, for you. Do you have any 80-20 hack that all the listeners, let's say they forget everything that they just listened to and they, they only remember one thing and, and you would give them one recommendation to, to have a better life? Do you have an 80-20, something they could start tomorrow and, and have the benefit right away? 80, 20, um, better like, uh, or better flow, let's say, oh, Rachel, better, and flow could mean, to have you know, you know, if, if it's, if it's gotta be one thing, I feel like fix your diet, you know, like diet is the one thing that like nobody wants to tweak with, but probably has more overall benefits than anything else. And, um, you know, the, the whole, like eat to live, don't live to eat. Like, I feel like that cannot be overstated. It's like food tastes good, but it's not better than relationships. It's not better than, you know, what you do all day, every day. It's not better than, you know, uh, how good your physical body feels. It's not better than living another 20 years. So, you know, even if it means giving up some foods you really like, like fix your diet. So, like that's the number one hack anybody can do. All right. Great. I actually heard that in, in Finland as well. You mentioned food and don't eat anything yeah. your grandmother wouldn't recognize. Yeah. Jesse, thank you so much for for all your time. That, that was great. It actually it helped. It really helped me explore uh, this topic that that right now I'm just emotionally involved with. Uh, and uh, thanks for being part of that. And on the cool, show. man. Well, ha happy to be here. Happy to help in in whatever way I could. <laughs>